Welcome one and all to joining us here again at the DM Lounge. It's the place where we delve deep into the dark, dangerous depths of the Dungeon Master's mind. Today we're going to be looking at all the questions that you as a fresh DM or maybe an experienced one may just have a few things that you want to kind of just kinks that you want to smooth out. So on today's um, episode we will be going through some of the questions that say some of you guys have put towards us and hoping to try to smooth out. On the cyber sofa today we have the wonderful best looking guy I know Mr Matthew Linfield. The second Okay, yeah, he's good looking too. Arthur Lamb. Hello. And also with us is the ever beautiful Emma Linton. So thank you guys for joining us. How are you guys doing? You all right? Awesome. Yeah, good. Happy to be here. <laughs> and we're happy to have you. So um, as always, so to everyone watching, if you like um, our kind of stuff, please give us a subscribe, um, ring the bell for notifications and leave any comments you have straight across. We will be sending out general messages throughout um, across the video of anything, any links or anything like that of where we speak about. Um, my name is Chris Haydock from One in 20. This is the DM Lounge. So let's get rolling. So on today's um, question, we will be looking at how do you start, um, how do you start to build your encounters? So as a whole, we know that um, encounters are inevitable in d and It's the kind of the main point that everyone plays it. And we know, say, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing on where to start, what monsters you're going to be creating, what the reason for having them. So with this in mind, uh, let's go through our couch and please, uh, Emma. How do you usually start? Okay, so most of the stuff that I do is is campaign building. Um, so as you know, I DM for a group of kids. Um, my usual first approach is what kind of encounter? Is it going to be combat? Is it going to be a puzzle? Is it going to be a trap? Um, my 13 year old kids like to have a combat at least once per session. They need to kill things or they get bored. So, um, so I usually have to have at least one combat in there. And then I, I start by looking at where they are. So, you know, what, what is the environment like? Are, are they on a ship? Are they in a jungle? Are they at the top of a mountain? Um, and then go searching for monsters that fit that environment. So, you know, that they're not going to have a mountain dwelling monster if they're on a ship in the middle of the sea. You've got to find something that fits. Um, I then would go off and say, OK, I'll start searching through the monsters and looking at the challenge ratings. Um, and I do use tools like Cobalt Fight Club, other ones um, to try and get a good balance in terms of, you know, how many players have I got? How many monsters do I want? Um, I try also to look at what the players are doing at the time. So if they're just trekking through a jungle, do they just happen to walk into a creature's territory? You know, maybe, maybe that creature's attacking them for food. What, what's what's the, the motivation, I suppose, of the monster? Um and uh sorry that's just uh, thrown me sorry no i know that completely thrown me thank you chris <laughs> hey, happens to us. Happens to us <laughs> um but yeah so so i'm looking at the motivation of the monsters um and the motivation of the party you know why are they doing this encounter are they trying to get something out of it once i've got my monsters i've got are they going to be surprised or not what are they there for i then look at treasure if there's going to be any and sometimes it's just gold and jewels. Sometimes it, I, I'm trying to work out, is it going to be something that leads to something else? So when they've killed that that guy in the robes, are they going to find a key that will open a door next session? So it, it's how am I fitting this into the story? So, so I try and mix it up, really. I, I'm, you know, they don't want to be fighting all the time, but I try and make it. Like last session, I did a chase instead of a straight encounter. I was like, instead of them just bashing each other to death, why don't we have them being chased and, and do that kind of scenario so okay so that's actually quite yeah. a good way of like just swapping it up a bit as well just so you've got that it yeah. doesn't always have to be a just stand down we're going to fight 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 it can it be it's a... interesting for me actually because i get bored with just you know throwing things at them to kill it's like... yeah no i mean so yeah anything say that's more engaging for say obviously you as the dm and like i said you've got kids so we all know that they just want to hack and slash everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I haven't done a whole lot of encounter building. I I wrote a one shot that is now becoming a sort of multi-part mini campaign. And that's the only thing I've really done. But the way I began that was I got a cool figurine 
And I thought this would be fun to fight in D&D. And then I built the entire thing backwards from that. So I was like, how would they get to this enemy? You know, what, how long have they been in the area? Uh, who have they, who have they got as allies and how would it affect the area around it? And that's how I came up with the entire story of what the one shot would be. I also knew I wanted there to be puzzles and mystery and intrigue because that's the kind of stuff I enjoy as a player. I am a massive puzzle nerd, so I wrote about. <laughs> yeah, I wrote I, I wrote a few and put them in there, and like um, I need to either replace them for if people are going to play it again or write more because as, as I've said, I'm now expanding it. So there's the and like you said. Emma, it's good to have encounters that aren't just combat. Yeah. So when when I did write this story, I was thinking, okay, well, this would definitely result in a violent pushback because they're getting closer to the secret and people want it to stay hidden. But there's also the, the whole first part of the campaign, or one shot at the time, has no combat at all. It's entirely figuring out this mystery. And it's not until you get to the depths of it that you actually start fighting. Because that's what I thought would be fun. <laughs> that's so, interesting, yeah. though, isn't it? Because you can then scale the encounters almost and make them either harder and harder or more and more exciting as they get towards the, the climax of the, the big boss yeah. fight. And you can sort of start really simple or yeah, straightforward. The, and... the only downside was I wanted it to lead up to this big fight. And I kind of, like you said, I wanted it to sort of increase in intensity, if not difficulty. But then I was, because it, it ends up in a sort of dungeon, and then I was sitting there like, oh man, if they don't, if they don't go and rest, then <laughs> they won't be able to fight this huge enemy. But if they do go and rest, their fault. <laughs> <laughs> if they do go and rest, then logically the enemies would regroup and they'd have to fight them all again. So I, I invented a spell that my NPC could cast. So throughout the whole thing, I'm saying in character, like, hey, guys, it's OK to just use all your spells. Don't worry about it. I've got the secret. And then right before the big final fight, I was like, she cast this spell and everyone's back to max. Oh, you're too I... nice. <laughs> <laughs> you're way too nice. <laughs> well, I wanted the most exciting fight that would like, you know, they'd find it satisfying if they were if they were at the best of their ability then they can fight with their utmost and that will be the most satisfying for them when they ultimately beat it. Yeah. That's true. I mean, so that definitely does make say, make it more enjoyable for people. Um, I quite like, say, the idea of the fact that, say, you've started pretty much at the end, really, and yeah. you kind of worked your way backwards. So, as, um, so for myself, I very much kind of go, okay, I want them to go from A to B. How do they get there kind of thing? Whereas you go okay, this is where they need to be, So yeah. and then work reverse, because it makes far more yeah. sense. So really, really yeah, think about absolutely. it. Absolutely. Because like, uh, when I was writing it, I wanted a really sort of tight, cohesive story, because especially, as I said, it was a one-shot and not a campaign, and now it's expanding. It's still going to be one narrative thread, but just longer than it originally was. So I don't... They don't have the freedom to just wander off and be like, oh, you know what, let's go follow his backstory today. Let's go to the pub for an entire session and just talk about <laughs> it. Like, I, I wanted to avoid that as much as possible because if they said, we want to leave, then as a DM, you don't want to go, no, you can't. But at the same time, say, I haven't prepared for that. Yeah. It's a one shot. <laughs> but don't. So I, I have to make it. Sorry. It's okay. I had to make it as sort of uh, linear and logical in terms of the next step as I could because then they would choose it and they'd stay on track with the story. It was a very light kind of railroad, but it's necessary in that. With one of. shots, it usually is a lot more like necessary because that, that's the whole point. If you if you don't follow that path, then you, you're not doing the one shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's like with um with with your one that you won. if all of us had just been like well i'm not going to touch that book then we've yeah. ruined it <laughs> yeah it would have been the shortest one shot ever and everyone lives <laughs> yeah i mean we did anyways or did we yeah, yeah. it's just like 
Um, it sounded like, say, throughout, um, say, most of that, that Emma's dog really agreed with what you were saying. He did. He yeah. absolutely agreed wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, you know that gnome thing, speak with small animals? Like, I just, I can't help it happen sometimes. Look, look, the dogs are in a D&D &D family, right? So <laughs> it's ingrained in them. They, they don't, they don't get any choice in the matter. <laughs> Well, Matthew, so what's your general way of doing things? So for me, just going off what both Arthur and Emma said there, um, it depends on like if it's a one shot or if it is a big campaign. Um, if it's a one shot, then there's usually only one major fight. So I do exactly like what Arthur um, did for his. And I think what's the big bad that I need them to face uh, just for the sake of the one shots and then work back. Like uh, Emma and I were looking at um, a one shot which I was helping her write the other mm. uh, day and we wanted to give them a little something before the big bad because we weren't sure that they were going to have gone through enough trouble to get there by that point. <laughs> You've got to make them earn it. We have yeah. to injure, injure them a bit before they yeah. get to the big bad guy, you know? Yeah. Them away at them. Just yeah. slap them about a bit. That's what everybody <laughs> likes. <laughs> but that same premise <laughs> I'd use for like um, a side quest in a campaign. <laughs> Like if I knew that I wanted them to like complete this uh, small small mission based off what was happening, I'd plan it backwards from that. So uh, I ran a campaign for uh, like everyone apart from Arthur. Sorry, Arthur. <laughs> um, but they were ended up being underground for like a few days, weeks. <laughs> it wasn't weeks. Oh, I felt like it. <laughs> you, were, you were underground for a long time. <laughs> I knew right that like, I'd planned there to be a big fight right at the end. So I had to like just balance stuff out so that you had a chance to fight all these things and feel the like risks of it. But then you still got to the end and actually had the challenging fights that like you were all hoping for. Even if yeah. there was a few times that Beecham almost died because of a Let's face it, we're, everyone who watches our channel sees what beach and rolls like. That's just the beach and thing. Just... Yeah. So no, just, just, just you was here. If you Chris, ever... Chris rescued him. Chris rescued him, took oh. him out. We healed him up and then he ran straight back into the gelatinous It wasn't cube. even that he ran straight back in. Like gelatinous cubes have a 20 foot movement or a 15 foot movement or something and they can then move that speed again. To attack. Yeah. 20 foot away, so it was just like in its range and he could have moved back another 10 to be safe <laughs> so funny i think oh it's just God. it's just luck, luck of the luck of the beach and we were in a game at uni but he wasn't even there for the first part of it so he said you can npc my character and while he wasn't even there his character shoved his face into a proximity rune and blew himself up <laughs> how's it going and we were like you're unconscious <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just, uh, just just getting back straight to the point. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. Beecham isn't here for us to. <laughs> so, I mean, Beecham, when when you do see this, <laughs> but, <laughs> just... <laughs> but uh, yeah, back to the encounter. So, if it's like a, a one shot or a side mission with that main enemy, then yeah, I work back. I work, look at what the characters can actually face using something like uh, Cobble Fight Club, or I use the uh, D and D encounter creator. Um, that's uh, currently uh, being made. And similar to uh, what Emma does with the CR ratings, try and find something which will actually give them a tough time. I don't tend to like giving players an easy fight, unless it's like after they've just leveled up and then an easy fight is just so they can feel extra powerful with all of their new abilities. They get a chance to do something cool and new. I mean, that, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a really nice way of doing it. Yeah, um, like, you, as soon, like, I think as soon as you level up, just chuck a really easy encounter just so they can show off their new stuff with no like, risks and they just like feel absolutely awesome. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought of doing that, actually. Yeah, that's... Um, I'm quite glad to say you brought up, say, the whole thing about um, CR ratings there. So I know for myself, uh, I'm awful at this kind of thing. And before there was, um, say, all these things like D&D &D Beyond and Counter Builder and the Cobalt, what was Cobalt Fight, Fight Club. And the Cobalt Fight Club um, and all things like that. I didn't have a clue how to set up, um, like, uh, CR ratings. Didn't know exactly what to do. At one point, as um, some of you, um, say, have, were part of, I nearly killed you all with a pack of badges. Um, yeah. So that was clearly 
my bad because I just made him too strong. And also I did the great DM thing of not paying attention to what your levels were and completely forgetting. <laughs> that does explain a lot, Chris, actually. I mean, it explains a lot about many things I do. I don't think about it. <laughs> I, I, I remember like, after that fight uh, when we were complaining about how difficult it was and you said, you're level five, you should have been able to handle that. Like, well, we were like, great. no. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of levels, you're fine. <laughs> um, anyways, anyways, going back to say to the point there. So, CR ratings. How do you guys go about that? How where do you go looking? Can somebody explain what C, uh, what um, CR stands for? Can, um, can I start with this, and then I'm expecting Linfield, who's much more of a rules lawyer than I am, to know the detail of this. And Arthur, feel free to chip in as well. Yeah, actually. But, kind of write my thing recently i actually have a little notepad that i made with a very simple breakdown of what you're supposed to do maths -wise. yeah love the, the, well i like maths but i've got to say the stuff in the dmg sorry wizards of the coast i love you but the dmg stuff's really confusing it just you read through what you're supposed to do and then it's all english but it might as well be swahili by the time i've read through it just i, I really struggle with that whole thing and if you um, speak Swahili, thank you for watching our show. Yes, exactly. <laughs> if you speak Swahili, come and tell me what it really means. Um, my my husband played 3.5 and previous editions and wrote books for um, various um, different, you know, D and D forums and and pre, you know publishing companies and things. So he's got this all in his head, and he'll just say if there's four players then that's one of these and if there's five players then it's two and he he's got it all i've still not actually worked that out i've got to admit that without this the encounter builders i'd be completely stuck um but I've, my, my understanding is is that a cr rating is the equivalent of four adventurers of that level i think that's my understanding mm -hmm. so a cr7 creature would be four level seven um pcs so so if you've got four players you're fine <laughs> the um the right. difficulty i have and i'm hoping that matt knows how to do this i really struggle when they're not fighting a monster when they're fighting another like an npc and maybe i've built that npc as you know a level 12 bard how to convert that into almost like a monster's cr rating for them to fight against i, I find that very very difficult I would love to know the answer to that. Yeah, so Matt, put you on the spot. Go on, how do you do well, that? I don't think there's necessarily a set way to do that, purely because if you're using what would effectively be a PC character, they tend to have a lot more abilities than your generic monster would. Yeah. So like, I'd, I'd probably try and work it backwards. So that would be the... So one of them would be the equivalent of what's a quarter of a 12th or a CR4. Uh, yeah, so yeah, CR3, geez. Yeah. Um, so I'd probably try and work it that way. Um, I'd then just to make sure I'd put it into an encounter builder just to see like how difficult that would be. Okay. Right, if I was to chuck a, like, a CR3 character in there. But again, I'm not entirely sure how that would work purely because they do have so many other abilities. Because I've resorted in the past to trying to find Wizards of the Coast NPCs of that level. Yeah. So, you know, because sometimes you do get in some of the adventure books, you'll get an actual NPC and they'll have given them a CR rating and you still see, yeah. you know, this is a, a level five spellcaster or whatever. And you can sort of gauge, can't you? And so yeah. sometimes I've done that, but I've, I've never managed to get the CR ratings completely spot yeah. on. The, the I, other mean, thing. I, I personally find CR like so. Again, anyone who may be really new, CR is the challenge rating. So the uh, level that the monsters are for your party. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've really struggled see, with um, uh, trying to get things right when it comes to that. Arthur, you said you had a little pad? Or... Yeah, I, I basically wrote down what it is in essence. So the concept of challenge ratings is that you, you get your party, but if you don't just have the four players or something you get your party and then you there's a table i believe in the dungeon master's guide which i don't own so don't hold me to that that basically has if you want an easy medium hard or deadly encounter and it will tell you what xp level you should hope to reach 
and that relates to the amount of XP you'll get from killing the enemy. And then what you do is you take the, you add up all of the XP of, like, say you've got multiple monsters, <laughs> you would add up the XP of all of them, and then depending on how many monsters there are, you would you might then multiply it. So, for example, if you had three uh, earth elementals that were attacking, then because there's there's three of them as opposed to just one, you'd times it by two is what the rule is. And if there's fewer player characters, you use the next highest difficulty multiplication modifier. And if there's more than five, you use the next lowest. Because obviously more the more players you have, the easier the fight's going to be. And I might be really being dense here, so I'm going to apologise no, for no, the viewers who are following right, Arthur word it, for word. It, it, it's a whole... Arthur's right. This is actually how it's laid out in the DMG. And it does talk about XP, like so experience point thresholds for each party member. And, that, and you compare that with the challenge rating XP, you the, with the monster's XP, don't you, Arthur? And that sort of tells yeah. you whether it's easy or medium or hard easy or deadly. Medium. Yeah, so, so well, I'll use the examples I've got here because this is what I did in preparation for the thing I'm writing. I'm expecting to have a party of five, but it might be six, so I put both of them here. So for an easy encounter, the threshold was 2,800 and 3,250 for six. And that's just a really easy one, so that's relatively low. But if it were to be deadly, for five characters is 12,900, and for six it's 15,000. So what you do is you look at the XP the enemy would give them when they defeat it, and it's, it's, it's a mix of simple and complex. Like, you can see the logical route that they took when they figured this out, and it does ultimately make sense. But especially if math isn't particularly your strong point it might be a little impregnable so that's why stuff like cobalt fight club cobalt fight club literally just does the maths for you so you don't even need to think about it the, the only downside is that it hasn't got every single enemy on there so and like you said if you're creating an npc that becomes a bit more difficult i think if i were going to do an npc who was the enemy i'd, I'd probably approach it by thinking, okay, so say they're a level 10 and all of my party are level 10, of course this enemy is going to get absolutely destroyed because there's like five of them and they're all the same level. So they'd need to be a higher level to be any kind of challenge. And I'd probably come at it from that sort of angle. Um, but, so, yeah, um, I, I totally like, agree with what Arthur was saying there in terms of uh, like scaling your characters or trying to scale your characters to it if you're creating against... Uh, creating an NPC for them to fight. Um, but I think one of the really easiest things for it is, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if you make your NPC too powerful for for your characters, because you can always give it either some handicap or just... If you've, if you've made a character and accidentally like just done pretty much a TPK because you didn't realise that your characters were, or your players were actually a lot weaker than you thought, or they just rolled really poorly and you rolled really well. You right. could have that big bad guy just laugh at how pathetic they are and walk off. Like, yeah, there's all kinds of story reasons you could make. I mean, you you could, like, say they're all about to die, you and you're panicking, and it's you expected this to be a nice big finale to the session today, but actually they're all nearly dead. You can just go he's about to lay down the last blow on one of you and that's where we'll pick it up next week and they all go oh no cliffhanger and you're like yep there's a there's a story reason coming and now you have to figure it out <laughs> so i mean yeah i mean so for a large part of this i mean so especially for i mean i know we all use it as well um if any new dms i would recommend say doing encounter builders um at least mm -hmm. to start off it doesn't always give you the exact perfect um, group to fight because sometimes it doesn't take into account um, certain things say, like immunities and things like that. But um, it's definitely something that I feel like is a good place to start. Absolutely. Yeah. I would uh, also say that I think if you are playing with the same set of people over and over, 
you'll start to get to know them and you'll know how well they fight, how well they strategize. Well, um, Strat yeah, so, so, so strategize. Yeah, I, I, didn't know, I didn't know teams could do that. Apparently, <laughs> it does happen sometimes. Um, well, you've not been playing with Liam for very long or something. <laughs> so, like, no, so, he, um, he's never that fun. <laughs> so um i know i mentioned in, in last week's session um you know there's a very there's a big difference between if i'm running my game with just the 13 year olds um they have a habit of not thinking beforehand running in and trying to kill the bad guy they very rarely run from a fight and they very rarely try and negotiate the way out of a fight whereas if liam's playing with us <laughs> um there'll be a full ambush set up they'll spend half an hour planning it um you know it'll all be there and on a number of occasions they've actually killed my bad guy in one or two rounds because of the way they've set it up and because of that that pre-planning um so i i tend to aim all my stuff at hard or deadly knowing that i can make it easier and it's almost easier for me to to make an encounter easy than it is for me to make it more difficult do you know yeah. I mean, I, I tend to aim hard and then reduce the hit points or have them run away or, you know, do that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, okay. I, I feel like it's much easier to suddenly make it easier by, you know, halving their hit points or something like that than it is to suddenly make it harder for them. Yeah, because if, if you make it harder, like if they think that they've just won this fight really easily and they're really proud of themselves and then you just go, uh, actually, no it really devalues what like the feeling of joy that they've just had it's much easier to go hard and then make it easier than easier and make it hard and i think so one of the things that we should always um, address is because being a dm is hard being a dm i personally think is a hell of a lot harder than being a character because you have so many other things on your plate and you if you go into these the nitty gritty details of is this too hard is it not Oh, and get a big headache when it comes to creating characters. You're not doing it the best way for yourself. So yeah, you're, you're a player too, and it's supposed to be fun. Exactly. So I think, say, like um, everyone here has said, always like you can always make them make them stronger, and then fudge some rolls, make them lose yeah, a bit of health, yeah. make them run away. Anything like everyone here has just said. Um, and on that, I think, say, we've probably covered say a large amount of things here. Can I just add one extra thing? Because I know that there's one thing that Liam always says, which we no, haven't. Away. Um, and <laughs> this is well, where we I'll see the fact that I've got the magic button. But... He has he has the power to cast silence, guys. You weren't here last week. He can literally wave his magic wand and silence <laughs> people. What if I ask no, really? I, I'm just going to throw out that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, Matt's choking me. <laughs> um, uh, Power is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matthew. Yes, one quick last thing. Um, a real like, if rather than going through all of like the CR ratings and whatnot, if you do just need a quick, simple fight, just because it's a random encounter or something, a really easy thing to do is look at the number of attacks that your enemies have. If yeah. you've only got like four characters who can only do one attack each. That's a maximum of four attack per round. If you give them something which can, if you give them an opponent which can deal eight attacks round, like four other people who get two attacks, just on action economy, they're going to probably lose that fight because they physically can't keep up. Yeah, that's a really good that point, actually. Liam yeah. like, always says that's his first thing when he's checking if an encounter is feasible. How many attacks do they, uh, can you, the enemy have and work around that? Yeah, it's just to add to that, that the thing where that really comes in is if you've got multi-classed players. Hmm. So if your player is, you know, I've got players in my campaign currently that are, they've just gone up to, they've just gone up to level nine, but two of them are multi-classed. So it's like two of them have got two attacks, but the other two don't because of the way that they've multi-classed. So I, I actually sent them up against something that was way too hard for them. And, and it was actually only meant to be a hard encounter, not a deadly but they didn't have enough attacks to actually cope with with that encounter. And it was only afterwards when, when me and Liam were looking at it that he was like, you know, we don't have magic items. We don't have two attacks per round. There was no way we were ever going to cope with that yeah. because of the multi-class. Right. And now on that, 
Yeah. So, mate, the, I do think so. That's so probably all the time we have left. One more thing in one sentence. Not extra. No. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> always offer them an opportunity to negotiate. Yes, you can give people the chance to negotiate. Or if you're the one on the host, you can just tell them to be quiet. So, on that, I'd just like to thank everybody here um, who's joined to discuss, say, how do you create your first encounter um, or any encounters in general? We've gone through, say, story reasons. We've gone through um, the challenge rating. Obviously, D&D Beyond um, has the encounter builder. We talk about the um, Kobold Fight Club as well. All these things. There's probably hundreds out there. Main thing is, is to make sure that you're having fun along with the rest of your group. You can always scale it back. That's always kind of, say, a good way if you're just starting off. You don't want um, to make everything really difficult for yourself. So, and if you want to find any of us here, you can find me at Scholar Chris. You can find Linfield at Logical Nerd 8088. You can find Arthur at Lamb Arthur Lamb. And you can find um, Emma at at Rowan Firefish. Thank you all very much. Please, um, if you do enjoy these things, give us a quick comment. If, they, if it really helped you, we do appreciate anything that you have to say. Anything um, you want to share with us or any questions you want us to answer please just drop us a message. If you want to get hold of 1 in 20 as all, well, our Twitter handle there is 1 in 20 TTG. Um, same as our YouTube. If you're watching this, you're already there. So <laughs> fantastic. I uh, hope you all very well and roll well. Bye. Bye.